Thank you for listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Visit guyswhodostuff.com. You probably shouldn't Google that. Hello and welcome to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. My name is Joe. And I'm Josh. And we are here over Zoom social distancing with our guest that we're very excited to talk about today, Royden Sa. And um, Royden, can you just start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your company? So great. Yes, I, um, I have a background in biology. So I love animals. I got interested in microbiology and then progressed into coordinating scientific uh, programs. So uh, right now, the company that I just started last month is called Health Preparedness and Crisis Management, LLC. And uh, it's a consultant uh, dynamic and it is in coordination with my regular job which is for working for a nonprofit called Island Conservation. And through the podcast, maybe I'll be able to make some parallels about what I'm doing in both yeah. uh, and how that affects everybody. I was interested when doing some, some research, you have 15 plus years experience in maintaining critical health relations operations in the most distressed environments. And as you were mentioning, some of that is due to your background in trying to prevent extinction, extinction in, in certain animals, in island environments. But that has also afforded you a lot of what seems like expertise in a field that is really needed right now, which is understanding the way that diseases spread. I, I noticed that you were invited to speak at the White House at uh, the Pandemic Protection and Forecasting event. What was, what was that like in that world? Yeah, so, so again, my, the, the context of where I came from is in island conservation. Islands represent a really special um, geography. It only represents about 5% of the Earth's surface, but it maintains about 20% uh, of the Earth's biodiversity, about 40% of the Earth's um, critically endangered vertebrates, and about 60% of the extinctions that have been documented since, since the 1500s. So really these are dynamic, very special places. And they're especially um, sensitive to invasive species. So, so I left my job in health to coordinate this very complicated or complex uh, program in developing a new tool to prevent extinctions on islands. I came straight out of uh, Ebola response in the health world. And so because I had Ebola response, pandemic response um, experience, my, rodents, invasive rodents are uh, vectors of some of the worst uh, human diseases like bubonic plague and such. Uh, and through conversations in Washington, uh, I was invited to the White House uh, pandemic preparedness and forecasting working group. So we explained the technology that we were developing for extinctions. And again, I think it's my background that, that uh, was the in in that situation. And I haven't heard anything about the role of rodents or birds or any animals as carriers inside of the current pandemic. So um, the current pandemic is coronavirus. And the current thinking, as I understand it, is that it is zoonotic or animal derived in origin, most likely from bats, probably from a different um, medium, uh, medium carrier. But all of the worst, or excuse me, most of the worst um, diseases are zoonotic in nature. So you think anthrax, bubonic plague, anthrax was from cows and such, bubonic plague is from rodents, fleas, um, coronavirus, bats. Uh, this, I worked on the SARS, uh, first SARS, uh, CoV outbreak back in 2003. So a lot of these organisms, a lot of these uh, pathogens are from animal um, origins. So I also noticed that you, ha I think you have a great definition on your website. I don't know that you were trying to define it, but when it comes to like health preparedness and our show is for uh, business owners and entrepreneurs, but there were a couple of things that you went into 
like maintaining essential business continuity, reducing illness and saving lives, and organizing your response in recovery. And so here in, in North Carolina, in, in our area, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about what us as business owners should be doing, what we should be learning from this current pandemic, and what should we be putting in place for the next one to protect our employees. You know, if you're, if you're watching the news, I think some companies, I'm thinking of Amazon getting skewered for not doing a good enough job in the public perception of taking care of their employees. And, um, and it probably stems back to the fact that they didn't have a plan in place for how to deal with a pandemic. Maybe they did, but certainly it didn't seem like it, it, was, it was enough for the, for the current yep. population's uh, perception of the way Amazon is handling it. So what are some practical things that, that you found as you're starting to consult businesses and nonprofits and government agencies that are kind of critical things that people don't have in place on how to deal with a situation like COVID-19? So from my perspective, uh, much effort needs to go into really focusing on the guidance from the health departments. Uh, you know, you can read the New York Times and you can read a lot of different media sources, but going straight to the source of experts in your county, and this is in the United States context, in your county, in your state, and the federal government. Um, during the front end of an emergency is going to be really critical. Immediately trans, you know, cha changing your perspective to understand that this is probably one of the most dynamic situations um, that a business owner will experience is going to be critical. Um, and then applying the guidance, the best information, and preparing your team with standard uh, communicate risk communications, emergency crisis communications. Um, so being accurate, uh, having empathy, and you know, communicating frequently, communicating first are going to be really important, um, not only at the front end but throughout this. So to answer your question, uh, going straight to the source of recommendations, understanding what those are, and following them, and then taking next steps is going to be really important. And so you started by mentioning the importance of following the rules in, in your county. Like, what are the sources specifically that business owners should be paying attention to? Um, hold on one second. I'm having some recording issues. I'm trying to figure out why it stopped working. Let me just restart this thing. I find, like, every once in a while, like, after a half an hour or so, I'll start getting this weird little buzz that if I just start and restop, the buzz goes away all the fun stuff we're learning with meetings over Zoom. <clears throat> One of the things I'll be talking about is flexibility. And uh, not only does it help in emergencies, but it helps in uh, changing formats of uh, podcast interviews as well. Check, check, test, test. All right, so just to make sure I've got a really, really clean edit, you summed it up really nicely when you just you started and said, so to answer your question, if you can just start there again. Yep. So to answer your question, uh, specifically for this crisis and really to extrapolate to any emergency, is getting the best information from, in this case, your health departments. So in the United States, county, state, and CDC, and deploy that information and prepare your staff for the most dynamic uh, situation that they will uh, experience, which is an emergency. And this is an emergency of really unprecedented proportions. Yeah, I think, do you believe that this, this pandemic that we're experiencing now because of the way that's unfolding, I think people's perceptions that I observed, so this is just anecdotal, um, that I observed early on was when there wasn't that many cases, it was treated like, as, oh, it's just a flu, it's not a thing. It's, and then as you get to the point where people start to know people who know people, now it's like, oh, this is getting pretty serious. And then you, in where we're at right now, we're being asked to, like Monday here in our state, the they're changing the grocery stores that only 20% occupancy can go in as well as the recommendation to start wearing masks. And now yes. 
Unfortunately, it seems like the cycle is we don't believe it until it's bad. And then when it's already bad, now we feel like we're behind the eight ball in, in, in treating it. So my question that I was rambling to get to is I have to imagine that not a lot of companies had pandemic procedures in place because we just hadn't experienced it in, in a way that affected all companies in the U.S. like this pandemic has. That is exactly right, Joe. So going back to my health department experience, uh, in between SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003 and the H1N1 pandemic, the influenza pandemic of 2009, the federal government, FEMA, CDC, put together an extensive pandemic influenza response plan, how to have every sector of society prepared for exact, not maybe exactly this event, but very close to this event. So how should companies prepare themselves? How to, you know, what kind of plans should you have in place for employees and how to deal with absenteeism during illness? All of that was put together in 2006. And I'll speak to the human dynamic, which is unfortunate right now, which is not necessarily putting weight into the experts. And so when there was five, 10, 15 cases recognized in the United States, every epidemiologist that I know was highly focused on recognizing what that means and trying to communicate what that means in the context of this uh, global outbreak. So, um, the experts recognized early on that this was this was shaping up to be a pretty bad uh, situation. Yeah, and it seemed like again from from my perspective, and this can be a little anecdotal. It wasn't until we started seeing a significant amount of cases that the public perception or the pundits kind of perception of it changed to be like, hey, you guys should pay attention to the experts. <laughs> Where early on it was like, oh, it's probably not that bad. Was kind of like the general pundits version of of what we heard about. Yeah, uh, again, I, I did not focus, I did not follow the media too much. Uh, I was really in the process of preparing my family, trying to communicate to my community. Uh, number one, identifying who the experts are in the situation. So not everybody with an MD is an expert on how to mitigate outbreaks, how to stop pandemics or yeah. reduce the impact. So that's really the, the role of public health. and. Um, and again, um, focusing on expertise, even if it's dry, even if it's not that sexy for media, is going to be really important. So just go to those websites is, is something that I've been communicating I'd, since January. I'd be interested to hear what you and your family are doing as far as taking precautions. Well, so around emergency preparedness, it's something that um, is not new. Uh, some of the activities that I've done in the past is just followed what the Red Cross uh, protocols are for preparing your family. Uh, CDC has a similar one. So having a stash of food for three days, having water for three days in case a hurricane or earthquake disrupts. And of course, those plans were for kind of acute regional or local based emergencies, a tornado, uh, uh, local crisis, where this is a uh, certainly, a, actually a worldwide crisis. So as the guidance changed, the CDC guidance said, okay, well, make sure that you have enough food in your pantry that you, you can sustain yourself without going to the grocery store often. Um, so I just, again, followed what the CDC was recommending, not only what they were mandating, not, what the, not only what the uh, local health department said, okay, you will not do this or you will do this, but also the recommendations. Yeah, taking them seriously. So I know a lot of the the small businesses in our area, in a lot of it's just industry specific as well. Some are getting hit very hard. Some are feeling not so affected. And there's a lot of people that are just um, not pulling the trigger on things that they would normally pull the trigger on because there's just so much uncertainty, which is just causing a lot of uncertainty. So what are good elements? What are the building blocks of a good pandemic plan? Because I think we could all, as business owners, start to think, all right, well, we need to be more prepared for next time. You know, you hear in the news, um, 
when the next pandemic is coming and it's nobody really knows with any certainty and I'm not trying to be a fear monger, but you've, you've been through five different pandemics now, correct? Uh, five different uh, outbreaks. Only one of them was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. That's a, yeah. that's a World Health Organization. Yeah. So uh, anthrax, uh, SARS, which was never declared a pandemic, the H1N1 pandemic, uh, Ebola, and, and right. uh, now this one. Yeah. So just by way of preparedness, I think it might be time for companies to start thinking, what is our preparedness plan? And so what are the building blocks for a good preparedness plan? I saw a couple of things on your website, um, prepare, how to prepare, respond, and recover. Um, what are some, some good steps that go into making us a solid plan? So again, these building blocks are all on, publicly available uh, by the, the folks that spend a lot of time putting these together. But having a communications plan and understanding how to communicate crisis, what happens when uh, you have a reduced workforce able to do the work because you're in the middle of a surge and you, know, you don't have 30%. So some of the building blocks are how to work with reduced staff, how to communicate to your staff what you're doing, how to communicate to your staff what is unknown, and how to communicate uncertainty in a way that is accurate but doesn't, you know, increase fear yeah. uh, and just kind of states how things are. So again, uh, I'll point to resources on the web that included um, crisis and emergency risk communication, CERC. That's, uh, that's available for all leaders. It's at the CDC website and the pandemic preparedness plans. Um, but at this point in time, you know, we're several weeks into it. Everybody's working from home, social distancing. Uh, for leaders now, it's time to get into the front end and try to be ahead of the curve. And in this case, it's what's recovery going to look like? How when when these re, um, social distancing, physical distancing uh, requirements are lifted, what is your organization going to do to number one understand what the recommendations are in your locality or localities, and then um, move to implementing them in a reasonable way that fits your company. Yeah. So can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, Jack. Hear you. So, Royden, what do you think about the conspiracy theories? Do you think it was really from a bat in a soup in an accident, or did a cat knock it off of a laboratory shelf and it spread into the world, or was it a bio-warfare? So, conspiracy theories, that's something that I don't deal in <laughs> uh, very often. Uh, and I will admit that I have not focused on the media representation. I have had a couple folks ask me about, um, about this. And so what I will say is that this is not an unexpected situation. This, the, what we're experiencing, you know, some people might have never thought about it, but there are large sections of the United States government of local health departments of state health departments that have prepared or tried to prepare for exactly what is going on here. So some people are caused by an element of surprise and it's hard to wrap your mind around what is happening. But again, there are a lot of experts that have been um, in various levels of sensationalism. Some, some experts you know, try to sensationalize it, some are very stoic and quiet and saying, okay, here are the best practices for what the U.S., what North Carolina, what Wake County should be doing to prepare yeah. ourselves. And this has been going on for literally decades. Yeah, um, I saw a documentary recently about the Spanish flu, and that was devastating. That wiped out like more people than the, the, all the wars we've been in combined, right? That's what, it, that's what I heard on the documentary. So you would think, like you're saying, that we would prepare for something like this, but we're not. So I come from a background of public health and I will tie it in, into conservation. Neither of those fields are very sexy. You know, let me ask you, how many people in the worlds of conservation or public health have you had on, the, on this program and other programs? So it's very rare that folks in those two fields um, have a you know, compelling story that fits Hollywood, fits however the media cycle goes until something like this happens. 
So let me back up to your conspiracy theory question. Sure. I believe, so again, because of my background, uh, when news of a, a disease popped up in that region of China, which is very close to where SARS CoV-1 popped up, it got my attention. I started paying attention to the World Health Organization website, and they're the ones who declare pandemics, uh, declare something called a public health emergency of international concern. So they started, the WHO, World Health Organization, started putting out situation reports. And these situation reports are, what is the accurate information, how the WHO is planning, and how they recommend governments plan for this. They started, I believe, on January 20th. And this was not declared a public health emergency of international concern until January, I think, 29th or 30th. Very, very soon after that, going from the experience of Ebola and, and SARS-1 of 2003, even anthrax, is tamping down the rumors, the um, misinformation that is going on, and really addressing that. So I believe it was maybe situation reports that rep number four or five from the WHO that they started recommending, get ahead of the rumors, tamp down with accurate information and acknowledge and move forward with giving your people accurate and actionable information for what to do in this crisis. Hold on one second. Let me try and stop and start again. Make sure that I'm starting to hear that bad stuff popping in again. I think we got it. <clears throat> just, so, to, just, to let you, just to let you know, Joe, I'm not hearing any of the... Uh, yeah, it's just on my end. I'm going to... Okay. One second. Let me unplug. Um, did it, Josh, did I answer your question? Yeah, that was sufficient. I mean, I was okay. like, that was uh, thorough and concise. So, yeah, well done. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, again, it's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot. It's, it's to be expected. Um, yeah. The conspiracy theories. You're really and good. The, Have you done these interviews before? Uh, no, first one. First one of like video. I've done, I've done a couple of uh, print, you know, they ask me questions. They give me a couple of questions in, in advance. Um, but no, thank you. I appreciate it because I'm really nervous, Josh. <laughs> well, you, you seem to have a good uh, understanding on the process of, you know, because if it were like a pre-recorded TV show, we'd have to stop and do staging. And then now it's, we're, we're all dealing with this Zoom disconnect thing so yeah but uh, thank you for your patience oh man thank you for having me I, I, at the front end like of course you're i am always thinking about oh what can i you know what am i going to do well, of course thank you but we jumped into it so quickly that yeah. i didn't really get a chance to say thank you for having me on and i hope this is helpful for your your effort and i hope it's uh, helpful for all of the um the listeners as well yeah well something i was gonna joe how are we how are we doing on your end and just got everything back online. So if you're going to start another question, Josh, go for it. Your, end, your back end is popping, Joe. That's good, that's good for you. Um, We're back into it. Go ahead, Josh. You seem to have a real heart or, yeah, maybe you, you seem to really desire to connect. Like you have more of, of just, you, you also care about businesses. It sounds like you sound like, a, like your mind is thinking about structure and, leading teams and connecting the dots for, for the unknown, because for a lot of people, this stuff is unknown. You know, people yes. don't know what you know and don't have the experience that you have and you've been to Asia. So this is an interesting bridge. This, this, just this podcast episode to have you here and have our audience hear what you have to say about it. That's, you know, that's what do you say about that? <laughs> so, so this, this emergency, is uh, so so let me break that down a little bit my interest in business and leadership um my background i'm a trained microbiologist that's where i went to graduate school and i was very i love microbiology it is something that i'm very enthusiastic about and i go out of graduate school and i become a, a lead in a 15 person multi-laboratory team working with food safety and i'm ready to save the world by making people's food safer. And 80% of my job as a leader was dealing with people, not microbiology. And the state, I worked for the state of North Carolina and they 
had mandatory classes. Oh, you have to go to these classes and it had role playing. And I completely, you know, not completely, but I did not buy into it. I looked at it as a requirement and didn't pay attention. So um, obviously I struggled as a leader during my time leading uh, food protection efforts. Um, this is an interesting part of my personal story. Um, the state of North Carolina put out a post uh, at the laboratory level. So remember, I was leading teams. I was not adequately prepared for leadership and administration. I'm a technical expert. They had a technical position working with bioterrorism response and planning in the Department of Health. So I put my name in the hat. I applied for it in the summer. And on September 6th, 2001, I was interviewed for the one bioterrorism response position directly dealing with testing of um, diseases like anthrax and plague and smallpox. And um, of course, five days after that was the attacks in New York and the Pentagon and such. Um, and then the world just completely shifted. So that was one of my first, you know, career type jobs. I out of graduate school. This is my career. And it started off in a really paradigm shift from the FBI bringing in one sample every couple of years that's a hoax to 1,000 samples being tested in three months at the state public health laboratory. So I realized as I ascended the, the ladder that dealing with people is important. You know, encouraging them is something that I always wanted to do, but it is actually a learned skill and encouraging them in a way that uh, promotes the mission is gonna be really important also. So I really focused on that dynamic as I uh, became a, a leader in the health department. And now with this crisis, it not only affects health, it affects business, it affects the economy, it, it really affects every sector of our society, even at the family unit. So um, yes, business is important and I'm working with a uh, uh, MBA program to, to help them kind of wrap their minds around what happens in pandemics, what happens uh, in regional levels. And of course, that's something that all sectors of society are feeling now. It's not just Liberia in West Africa or uh, some part of Asia or a small town in uh, the United States. It's pretty much everybody. I appreciate so much your your answer to the question about preparedness because you know you can lose perspective because you could feel like like probably many of us feel that we just weren't prepared. But what you're saying is there were there are a people there's a group of people that have dedicated the majority of their working career to come up with these plans. And yes. the fact that I wasn't aware of them until I needed to be doesn't mean that we as a country weren't prepared. But it just kind of goes back to what you were saying, which is that's why we have to lean into the experts instead of each of us trying to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's a great kind of transition into talking about how we as companies and business owners can learn from what's going on now. And I appreciated your answer about like uh, where to start because you talked about internal communication, start with your employees, manage expectations, make sure that they're aware of what's going on. And I know like many people, I saw so many COVID-19 emails from businesses that I have done business with that, um, and some of them were good and some of them were like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> yes. So when it comes to that type of communication, that, that letting your, your frontline business, um, letting your customer communication forward facing, what are some of the bright spots and what are some of the really bad examples that you saw? Some of the, I mean, the easiest bad example is to have this international crisis that is just consuming productivity, consuming effectiveness in government and um, business everywhere uh, is to, to do nothing, is to not communicate. Right. So again, I, I, uh, the things that I've seen that work well are things that really follow um, uh, the science behind emergency communication, which is be first, be accurate, you know, recognize that um, there are limitations, you know, recognize the situation. This is a dynamic situation. This is going to be changing. And, and maybe, you know, I guess, let me back up. Maybe a lot of leaders didn't realize that 
what a real emergency is, okay? So let's start with what a real emergency is. There's a lot of talk um, about emergency declarations and the use of money and use of political power. But really, to me, an emergency is where your life, safety, or uh, way of living is immediately affected, immediately affected. And again, very early on, the WHO, World Health Organization, declared this a public health emergency of international concern. That was January 29th. And so um, if you're a business leader, at that point, the best case scenario is to recognize it, have it register. Oh, wow, we get our product from China. They're really affected. The, the city of 11 million people is completely shut down. What the heck is going on here? Um, in an emergency, it's really important to get accurate information as much as possible and to be able to use that in, in action. So the WHO declaration early on, the fact that China was shutting down large sectors of society and not too much was, was happening here was something that set alarm bells off in, in, in me. It's like, well, you know, we need to be doing a whole bunch more right now. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. Your question was, uh, what are some of the bright spots and what are some of the, the things that, that – Yeah, maybe some of the, the bad examples of, of COVID. Bad example. Okay, so uh, I've seen an email. I, well, first of all, uh, I've seen organizations that did not say anything about it for weeks. Yeah. For weeks. Um, and things were popping up. It's like, hey, you know, this is affecting – you know – we haven't, we're having to stay home, you know, kind of communicate this. So I've seen organizations do that, um, not say anything when they really should have. And then I've seen organizations and leaders at times say, okay, we don't know what's happening exactly, but we're going to put together an interdisciplinary team kind of, again, in an emergency situation, unbound the, um, traditional hierarchies because we need to solve this problem or at least recognize it very quickly and, yeah. and move forward. Some of the ones that I thought, uh, just sorting through my inbox or different types of communications that I saw, the ones that I thought did an incredibly good job were the ones that addressed customers' concerns as well as talked about how that company is pivoting to address their concerns. Uh, I yes. saw one from a a home remodeling company called Wake Remodeling, and they are now adjusting so that they can do virtual um, walkthroughs of your home and give you virtual quotes uh, so that you don't have people coming in your home because a lot of it's about people's uh, perception of their safety right now. And um, having never been through a situation like this before, I'm wondering, is there any kind of information out there that talks about let's say that social distancing restrictions get, um, get lifted. Does that mean that people are going to feel comfortable and start venturing out? Or is there going to be a time where people are going to just kind of wait and see? So again, this is an unprecedented situation. So I have to add a lot of caveats, but um, you know, looking at the amount of fear going on in some sectors of society, lack of concern that is being uh, acted upon in some sectors, uh, it will be difficult to recover from this. So really the, the process in my opinion would be to start preparing for that when these things are lifted. How are your staff gonna feel? So you pointed out the importance of communicating to customers. I would also elevate the importance of communicating to staff because without those staff, your customers are not going to get anything. You can have a leader that is 100% comfortable about the process and we got this, but if that buy-in and that engagement has not happened yeah. in a respectful and empathetic way, the likelihood of success to be able to deliver to your customer is going to be diminished. So yes, it's a multi-faceted front of customer awareness and focus, staff awareness and focus. And then let me add one more thing. In severe crisis, uh, the strain on mental health and emotional well-being is very difficult as well. So I would, I would 
um, advise leaders to also focus on their well-being. If they're not healthy, if they're not thinking calmly yeah. in a very stressful situation, they're not they're going to have a reduced ability to communicate to staff, to communicate to customers. So let's, un- let's unpack that a little bit. Again, Health Preparedness and Crisis Management, LLC, you're, you're in this consulting type of environment. How do you go about talking to your board? How do you talk to your executive team? Um, and how do you talk to your HR team about this, this recovery phase, like getting back into it? What's, what's kind of the education process look like? So that's a that's a big question, and if you if you notice, I, I communicate with governments that have complete health departments, and um, I have not. You know, this is a very very new venture. Yeah. Uh, but I look at the the informal consulting I've done. It depends on a lot of what the situation is. There there are organizations out there that are remote. Everybody operates remotely. Uh, let's say IT support services that their physical functioning hasn't been altered hardly at all. Right. And then you have uh, high contact delivery, you know, uh, service deliveries of, you know, working on houses, mm-hmm. interacting with customers directly. Um, so there's a series of things that would sh- should be done again, starting with what the, recommendations are and understanding exactly what those recommendations are for your area or areas. Um, I'm sorry, go back to your original question, Joe. Um, well, I just kind of want to focus a little bit about, because you mentioned uh, mental health and what are the role that HR should be playing right now in an organization during a crisis like this? That's a, that's a great question because uh, the complexity of what is going on right now for HR professionals is astounding. Everything from um, understanding what is recommended for health um, information. Does one of your staff members have it? Is that legal to get that information? Are you a uh, local just in the United States? Are you a global organization? Does it fit? Um, the, the laws of each of the uh, places that you're working with. So um, just understanding what needs to happen right now with this, especially with documenting if you have cases inside your, um, your organization, the HR department, but also again, preparing staff for high absenteeism if uh, this spreads uncontrolled in, in areas, in your areas. Um, what are you going to do? Are you going to adjust your policies to say, um, to, to accommodate the fact that we are in an emergency? Right. And without having specifics, I would say it is very important for the HR department to have as much flexibility and creative thinking as possible. And that's something I have, that I, I could imagine help. if you had a relatively large company that there are probably a handful of things on your policies and procedures as an HR team that just currently don't make a lot of sense right now that you should continue doing them <laughs> and um, not yes. having that flexibility to address that as a team or how, how to bring that up to your executive leadership team or how to make people aware of that. Things like, I don't know, like I'm just thinking about like little silly things like vacation time. Uh, how flexible should you be with additional vacation time? I know that's one of the things that, the Amazon workers are frustrated with is that Amazon is allowing people two two weeks paid vacation if they get COVID uh, or two weeks sick time, not paid vacation. And then they either have to return to work or something, which what might be an old policy that just currently doesn't make any sense right now any longer. Mm-hmm. To be like, yeah. If you're really sick, you get two weeks, but yeah. probably something that you need to just address and look at. So I think that's, that's probably a good takeaway as a business owner or somebody in charge of a, of a company or a corporation is to think through what are your existing policies need to be adjusted because we are in a state of emergency. Yep. I will also add, and this is going to be critical, is the focus on team and mission and the fact that if you can create policies that bring the team together and really focus on getting through this as a community, yeah. And whether that community is your neighborhood in West Raleigh, where I, I live, or your, your company, which we have a lot of remote employees, but, you know, just as an example, one of the things 
um, that I offered up to my organization, which is oh, the foundation. Again, I'm still. Hold on one second. Um, yep. I, when I said just an example, just give me one second, see if I can fix yep. it. Oh man, this is pretty a pain in the butt. Don't lose your train of thought. I just gotta. I'm 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 trying to stay on it. That's a that's a tall question, Joe. That's a, that's a big <laughs> one for me. I have never had this many problems with it. Crazy. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. I'm I'm in and out right now, guys. I'm just trying to be quiet and be because my mic is going in and out, but uh, this is going great. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Me too, Josh. Again, thank you for, uh, for having me. You got it. Sorry I couldn't provide you with your pumpkins this year again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got it. I got it. I really miss, really miss it. So what's going on, Joe? I got it working again. Okay, good. So where were we? Uh, Examples. Oh, so, so uh, something that is going to be really important for HR and leaders and team members to do is do so again this is an emergency everybody everybody in really society but in an organization needs to pull together to say what can i do that will help out so we talked about hr policies and leader leader dynamics um, anything that the hr policy generation can do to pull the team together to make it we are in this together um, is going to be important and same for the leaders and again same for the staff i would give different messages to the staff more of tolerance to you know uh, crazy situations dynamics but the hr what can you be employing that takes care of your immediate needs which is okay staff member gets sick is out for two weeks but then gives it to their significant other or their parent that's in the, in the household. And they're going to be out for another, you know, we're completely distracted because of this crisis. Right. What can the HR policy do to accommodate for that one situation, but also accommodate for all situations and, and creating flexibility that bring people together, bring people, people to focus, focus. We are all in the same boat. And some of those things that I, uh, have seen employed is donation of leave time. Okay, so I have been working for Island Conservation for several years. Uh, I have a lot of leave built up. If there's something that I can do to, to donate it to a team member that is in a bad way, that just came on board and doesn't have any vacation or whatever, that actually creates a great dynamic of, of pulling people together and recognizing that we are all in this together. Yeah, that's a great idea. I like I like kind of the theme of the talk today, and it, it wasn't an angle that I had considered, but I love the idea that just keeps coming up over and over again as there have been people that have worked hard on emergency plans, and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Like if you find yourself as the business owner sitting in meetings or Zoom meetings with your board and your executive team being like, all right, guys, what are we going to do? You might have missed a very big step because there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. There are, there are guidelines that have been well thought through by experts and that have been working on these guidelines for decades, uh, trying to learn from past similar things. Even though this is an unprecedented thing, like you said, it's not completely unexpected in the sense that most of us think that it was unexpected because we haven't prepared at all because it didn't hit our world. Uh, yes. But there are people that have been thinking through the the complexity of a situation like this to provide the kind of guidelines that can give us a fantastic starting point, if not a complete set of directions on how to handle and communicate in an emergency situation. Yeah. So that's really awesome. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. As a consultant, for a second, Joe. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so Royden, as a, as a consultant now, what are some ways that, that people can get a hold of you? Me, Josh, like to talk about is actually, the island conservation portion of it, because that is a very complex scientific program to try to stop extinctions from occurring. And we're in an extinction crisis right now. Not everybody knows that, but experts in uh, biodiversity and extinction, extinction. recognize that as well. So uh, I just leave that open to y'all and I can talk about both. Um, 
it's been a pleasure. I've had fun. You've made it fun. I was nervous coming into this, <laughs> but I hope I represented your. Yeah, your you did great, man. Okay, good. So um, yeah. I realized that I didn't hit record on the video for the recap, so I'm going to do it one more time. Okay. So. <laughs> And thanks again so much for coming on the show and sharing your expertise. Uh, again, it's Roy and Shaw with Health Preparedness and Crisis Management. And I know that that's a relatively new venture for you and you're providing consulting and helping people walk through their emergency preparedness and offering consulting. So how can people get a hold of you? The website is hpcm.tech, T-E-C-H. So that's H, like health preparedness crisis management dot tech. And my email is Royden, R-O-Y-D-E-N, at hpcm.tech. And again, it's a new venture. I appreciate you uh, having me on to talk about it and making me feel comfortable. And I hope I've been helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to get you back on to talk more about what your, your work with the Island Conservatory. Great. Love to do it. It's a very dynamic and complex uh, project that actually has a lot of tie-in to health. That's why I was hired into it. So that's a completely different story. And I'd be glad to discuss it uh, at some point in the future. Yeah, well, tease, tease it out a little bit. Why is it so connected? What is, what is the connection? So the connection here is that we have a worldwide crisis of loss of biodiversity. So animal species, plant species, insect species are going extinct at an alarming rate. And the projections are that it is going to continue. So the best scientists say that in the next 30 to 50 years, one million species are at risk for extinction. So in 30 to 50 years, are we gonna be talking about, oh wow, nobody saw this coming, kind of like we did on this, or are we going to um, be able to collectively do something about it? The reason that it's relevant is because I was hired into island conservation because the technology that we are looking into using is uh, powerful, hopefully, and somewhat controversial. It has a checkered history uh, because of the biotech backlash of the 1980s and 90s. So I was brought in because of my ability to focus on a complex program, international program that does not have any clear uh, precedence and uh, focus on the biological safety. What if we make this technology to um, prevent the extinctions by removing invasive species from islands and it gets off of the island? That's a major concern with you know, developing these things called gene drives. So that's a little teaser uh, yeah. for next time. I watched some of the YouTube videos on it. It's very fascinating. Um, I wasn't aware of how much the islands that are such a small, I think it was about 5% or 6% of the, of the land mass of the world have such a huge influence on biodiversity, just way disparaging numbers, like it's 6%, but I think you said it was like 50 or 60% of the diversity exists on these islands. Yeah, of the extinctions that, that have been recorded is about 60% since the uh, 1500s. And a lot of that is because of invasive species. And so island conservation is focused on one thing, preventing extinctions by removing invasive species from islands. We've been doing it for 25 years. I was brought in to um, help responsibly innovate and develop a powerful technology that biosafety is a concern. So um, yeah. again, completely tied in and love to talk to you more about it. Thank you for uh, letting yeah. me give a plug because let me just say one more thing. My organization, I'll repeat this, has given me leave the ability to have leave without pay to consult to help out with this health crisis this human health crisis while doing benefits for the um for the organization itself so i really have to express gratitude for island conservation allowing me the flexibility to try to get something on my own try to help the community but also help them so uh, they've been taking a proactive stance at how to deal with this fantastic well we really enjoyed talking with you today likewise